time comes. So thanks everyone for coming today. I'm just gonna go ahead and start us off with our land acknowledgement and then I will pass it over to Chris Hollis who's gonna talk to us about the closed loop referral system. So the New Mexico Alliance of Health Councils humbly recognizes and acknowledges that we are on unceded territory and ancestral lands of the original peoples of New Mexico's Pueblos, Apache Nations, and the Navajo Nation. Together we acknowledge the history of genocide, dispossession, colonization, and ongoing systemic inequities while strengthening and respecting relationships with indigenous peoples. We give thanks to the past, present, and future stewards of this land and respect all tribal nation sovereignty. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous resiliency, self-determination, and self-governance of New Mexico's tribes, pueblos, and nations who are still here today. All right, and Chris, with that, I will go ahead and pass it over to you so you can get right in. All right, let's see, everybody bear with me, this, this technology. And let's see. Okay. Is everybody seeing that in sort of presentation mode? Yeah, we're seeing the presentation, we're not seeing the notes, perfect. And I don't know if I, unfortunately, I've got all my, trying to figure out how I do this. I've got all my, my the people that I can see sort of on the left, I'd rather have them at the top, but I don't know how to do that. So anyway, um, and nobody sees people in the way of this picture, right? Nope. Okay. Um, let me just ask all of you, uh, you know, a lot of you have been involved in this for a while. Um, just anybody raise your hand or whatever in terms of, have you heard of the closed loop referral system? Have you heard that mentioned anywhere lately? Maureen, I figured you had. Yes, you've been pretty involved in it. <laughs> Anyone else? Because I can't, I honestly can't see and everybody. We're getting, we're getting some thumbs up, Enrique says, Deborah, okay. Brenda. Okay. Just, okay. Just wanting to kind of, I, I figure most of you know, know something about this or, you know, have either heard me or have been part of the group that's working on this. So I just wanted to kind of get that. I'm going to um, go through it quickly. I'm hoping, hold on a second. Um, by the end of this, and I'm hoping that we have the hour and that I only take about 28 minutes or 29 minutes or something in showing this, and I'll show you why in a minute, and then we have discussion. So literally at the end of this, I'm hoping you will have some ideas and be able to put them forth about how do these changes that may take place, uh, some of them will take place, um, how does that sort of affect health councils or what do you think the role may be for you all? Um, you'd be able to just give the basics of what a closed loop referral system is if somebody asks you. And then, you know, just nod knowingly if somebody mentions turquoise care or the primary care council or making care primary or anything like that. So that's all I'm hoping for out of this. Now, I'm going to do something for a different change. I'm hoping at the end of this session, I would like to ask you these questions. So I'd kind of like you to be thinking about this as we go through the presentation. So in other words, like the changes we're talking about, do they have any relevancy to health councils? Um, health councils are made up of community-based organizations, which are gonna be very important in all of this. So what kind of potential part or role can health councils play? So kind of keep thinking about this and whether the health councils can help get community input. So I'll come back to these kinds of questions at the end. As I said, I'd love to have discussions, see your ideas. Um, to start out with though, and I know that some of you are very familiar with this, uh, others are not, but going back to like 2016, 2017, there was the movement to change public health into public health 3.0 which in a way we are doing in New Mexico. Um, some parts of it, we are doing better than others, but literally this is why it was done. It's driven by payment policy changes. Um, our healthcare system is transforming from what we call an episodic 
non-integrated care system toward one that is value-based, and we'll talk about these terms in a minute, and would benefit from collaboration with allied community efforts. So in a way, for public health in particular, it was seen that these, and I know some of you have talked about the three buckets that CDC talks about, and sometimes with a little chuckle to go with it, but literally, these are the areas we're talking about. Public health in our system tends to be more focused on population health, community prevention, that's where the health councils come in a lot, but also in addressing any of the sort of non-medical social needs. I mean, helping people who are food insecure get food, helping people who've been thrown out of houses, help finding that kind of help. Public health still and community agencies get involved in those kinds of things. Where things are moving now with some of the change is to try much better linking the traditional clinical and medical interventions, so the health care side, with also addressing those non-health social needs. Um, and we'll talk about that term in just a minute. So you can see where this is kind of crossing over and where public health needs to be involved. The other thing is that, as many of us know, since COVID, there has been a lot sort of talked about, we've talked about it among ourselves, but how do we sort of transform public health after something as big um, as COVID and how it changed everything? And some of the key areas that are being put forth that public health needs to transform in itself are in the areas of greater accountability. This all goes a lot to the um, accreditation standards also for the Department of Health. And I'm not sure how much the health councils may know about this themselves, but the health councils are considered, you know, a part of the public health structure in New Mexico. So one of these is greater accountability, and we all talk about that, but this also pushes not just for better um, sort of transparency, but also doing more power sharing with you know those populations we haven't involved in less in power sharing in the sense of decision making and budgeting reducing polarization i mean we all recognize right now how much politics is getting in the way of you know moving forward in a positive way so one of the things is to try looking a lot more for nonpartisan types of partners but also looking a lot more for common ground in what we're trying to do especially with social drivers of health one of those areas that a lot more people are, you know, coming together on is climate change. And what they're recognizing here is that for public health, we not only need to deal with it from looking at the root causes and trying to improve that, but also public health needs to deal with the effects of climate change, such as heat stroke, such as, you know, a lot of different health problems that are arising out of this. Equity is still very important to health equity, um, but there, really there is a push to do more action on this to move us forward in this direction and you know have um bigger and better relationships with more diverse communities um again most of us we've realized and we're going to see it in this closed loop referral system what we're talking about you may all be kind of thinking my god i'm dealing with this software over here and this it platform over here and everything else and there's a database here and a database there, we have so many databases these days, but not all of them talk to each other. So what we need is that kind of integration, that kind of harmonizing so that when we're looking for the data to help us, we're better able to do that, which also means when you look at workforce development, a lot of that for us is we not only need to figure out how to motivate more workforce joining or at least more primary care providers and others how do we motivate people and into public health also but we need a lot of new skills a lot of that is around data and the data science and things like that but the other part is an improved communication and i know i've heard all of us talk about communication but the push here is to not think so much in the way we have been spreading messages that public health wants to get all the time, but to have more social marketing techniques 
to think more about, you know, sort of identifying particular audiences, framing messages, tailoring messages, using behavioral health theory, and things like this. So these are the areas that we're probably going to hear a lot more about in terms of change. Um, I'm going to skip through this because I know you all are pretty hip on all of this. But let me just ask you, what do you see as the difference here? Why is the bottom one equity? As a, I mean, in the equality, they all have the opportunity for transportation, right? Equal opportunity for transportation. What's the difference with the equity one? Just call it out. Or what do you see? It meets the needs of the person, not just what they need, but how they need it. Got it. Okay. Because, for example, the little woman over there who is in a wheelchair absolutely can't even access it, even though it is provided, right? So the idea is that we act and we act to make change so that now everybody still has a transportation method, but we have made that available to different groups of people in an, in an appropriate way. So a lot of this is around the action piece, you know, changing things. I'm not going to spend any time in this. You're all very familiar with social drivers of health. These are the bigger conditions in the environment. Um, and we see these differences all the time. And, and a lot of the health councils, I believe, have even chosen, as the DOH has, priority is to address some of these. But to gain health equity and remove the health disparities we're talking about, we have to take action. Too often, I think we pay attention to just defining what health equity is and not going on to the next like sentence, even in the definition that says it requires action for us to change things. And these are sustained, big systems change efforts if we're really gonna address those social drivers of health and getting at these historical and even contemporary obstacles. And that of course means that we need to start digging in and many of the health councils have been doing this digging into those root causes for those social determinants, the policies and what's under those, attitudes, uh, racism, those kinds of things. Given that, and as I mentioned, some of the health councils, I know at least two or three that I worked with, did a lot of sort of thinking about this tree that we think about and the questions of why and um, sort of the top outside level is where a lot of our community-based organizations work. They're supporting people who may have diabetes or they're trying to prevent diabetes, um, a lot of that. Now, as we know, those are kind of, diabetes, for example, is the outcome. It is the symptom of what's wrong. We've come down and we've worked a lot on sort of what's the health behaviors, for example, that help drive that. Okay, that's diet. But why can't people have a better diet? Why aren't they following it? What are the things? Is it just their own, you know, personal preference? And this is what they're going to do. Or are there other things? And certainly you all know, and this is why you're addressing it, but we've come to believe in these sort of built environments, the social determinants of health now, uh, built environment. And now not just the social environment, but also the commercial one for a lot of these things. And I was going to ask you, when we start digging deeper into some of the other causes here, what about, what do you see in these root causes or underlying systems pieces? Do you see anything that will relate to why there is so much diabetes here in New Mexico? Any of these that you feel are really related? And there are more. Anyone? Well, I'd say poverty because they can't afford healthy food. And okay, healthy poverty. Food is cheaper. Poverty is it's also what you were just going to say. I think. Yeah, poverty. Uh huh. And it's also just as I think you were going to say, it's cheaper sometimes to buy the bad foods 
or like the fast foods yes. than it is to get the really nutritional ones. Um, and poverty is going to, one would maybe even want to dig into that a little bit more. Why aren't there jobs available in this area? Those kinds of things. But for example, distribution of resources. I've been working with Roadrunner Food Bank lately. And I mean, this whole thing of even getting the trucks to various places with the foodstuffs, um, this is, you know, a big issue. And a lot of grocery stores don't locate themselves in rural areas because they feel the population is too small for them to make a profit. So you've got things like that. You've also got, for example, the high cost of insulin. Now that's changing somewhat. But um, again, these are things set up by a pharmaceutical, the commercial environment and everything. So I'm just uh, probably spending way too much time on this because you all really know it. So let's just look at some of the key components of change here. But let me ask you, because we're going to go into this with the change. What, what is it that you hear from, you know, the members of your community that you deal with all the time? What are your thoughts about our current health care system? Is it the greatest in the world? What's good or bad about it, in your opinion, or what you hear from people? Chris, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, up here in Harding County, by and large, I think on the local level, people are very, very pleased with the health care situ situation, but nationwide, they're not. Any reasons why they may not be, just broadly? I think probably you can sum it up in two words, and it's red tape. <laughs> Boy, that's that's fascinating, and I think that is a good part of it. Um, I and yesterday it, again, I listened on something. When we get down to the second question on the our system for referring people for other services, it, I was amazed at the amount of red tape, just like you're talking about forms, uh, regulations all kinds of things that people have to go through to be able to get these kinds of services when if they were paid an adequate salary, they could probably just trot down to the grocery store and very easily get food that's good for them or something. Exactly. And and I am a perfect example. Um, I have diabetes and I took metformin and it rotted all my teeth. And I have seven teeth in my mouth. So I made an appointment in October to see a dentist in Las Vegas. And I got an appointment for July the 28th. And so I think frustration has a lot to do with it too. So and, and a lot of, and Barry, I think, I think this was Barry speaking, but I mean, yes. in many cases, as we all know, everybody has a problem with the access, definitely to the healthcare services, you know, and, and that's both in terms of time and in terms of where services are. Um, and actually getting the kind of service that's really going to be a benefit to you. Yes. Anyone else? Okay. And how about the second question? What about our system right now of when we all try to refer people um, to the other kinds of services, social services that the community provides. So that could be either mental health, behavioral health services, housing health, uh, transportation health, utility health, any of these kinds of things. How has this been, or what do you hear about it? Um, I think it's the same problem he was talking about, lack of providers, especially in the rural areas. Um, they sign up for a bonus and they stay just as long as they are required to stay. Then they move on and then people are left in the lurch with no provider. And the ones that do stay are so overrun with patients that they they can't even provide good care. And then we try and make referrals and appointments but you know like he was talking about we're talking six months down the road a year down the road um and i think it's starting to invade everywhere in new mexico not just the rural areas uh, yeah the needs are so great yeah anyone else any thoughts on this 
I think there's a disconnect within the communities because um, like say for instance, if somebody is unhoused, they need, they need housing. And um, let's say this, this agency refers to another agency with housing. How are they going to know if the person actually received the services, or they were if they were taken care of, or if they had any um, issues? Because sometimes they'll go to a, an office and then they have issues, and then they won't go back. So the referring agency doesn't know if they did, you know, get their the service that they needed or not. So there's that huge disconnect within the communities. There's a lot of organizations that are doing stuff, but there's they're not. Uh, talking together, there's no connection to see whether the person actually received the service. A good point. That's, those are those are all, all of them are great points. Um, and you all are working with a lot of those community-based organizations that are providing these services and everything. But yes, one of the big ones is we really struggle to know where are those community-based organizations? Are they good? You know, do we have a contact there? If we send somebody there, are they going to be received well? Are they going to be able to get the services? If they get the services, how do we know, you know, that that happened? And, you know, did it help? So, and, and all of these, I think, and as you know, in the rural and frontier areas, pretty hard to find these resources too. So I'm going to, these are some of the reasons why people are moving toward the change. And in New Mexico, there's about four bigger pieces to this driving it. Most of you have at least heard of turquoise care, and you know what it is, and that's a big player in this. Accountable health communities, the reason we're talking about that is that's been going on in New Mexico since around 2015, 2016, and it basically serves as the underlying model for the closed loop referral system that's coming in now, or people are working on the other one is that we are shifting in New Mexico to value-based payment. We'll talk about what that means. The other thing is, for many of you who may know this, we are one of eight states that has recently received a Making Care primary grant. It is a 10 and a half year funding grant from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to improve our whole primary care system. And we will talk about that. So I'm not going to spend much time on Medicaid because all of you probably deal with it. And in fact, I'm sure a lot of you are helping people get enrolled and re-enrolled in Medicaid. But as you know, it's both between the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services, but also the state. Each one has certain things they can do within it. Um, like, for example, provider reimbursement. That's New Mexico's kind of state on this, although CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, does kind of monitor what's going on. Now, the thing is, again, many of you may know this, but if you hear about the 1115 waiver, which is what New Mexico has just submitted to the CMS in 2023, this is what gives the HHS the power to be able to say to a state, if you pose it and you have a better plan for making Medicaid, you know, more accessible or quality level for your patients, we can authorize that kind of change. But, you know, they have to review it like any other kind of grant. So we have in New Mexico, starting in July this year, Turquoise care will take the place of Centennial care. Again, it's Medicaid in New Mexico, but there are some differences, and one of which is to, again, move us to a more person-centered Medicare deliveries, Medicaid delivery system. Well, no. <laughs> one thing I do want you to understand, because I hadn't originally, one of the key things that was different about turquoise care when it was proposed to the CMS was that we would have a closed loop referral system. The state would design one. That's a community-driven, coordinated healthcare and social service kind of referral system, just we were talking about, um, to meet both the medical and the social needs, such as housing, food, transportation, utilities, and all of those needs of people. And the closed loop, means that you are going to have the information coming back so you can see what happened. 
Now, the thing is, the state put that in their referral into their waiver. However, in January, New Mexico let CMS know that it's no longer requesting approval for that closed loop referral system. It actually, the legislature is paying for the development of a state closed loop referral system in New Mexico. So keep thinking about that. Um, legislators should be very interested in how this is progressing. Accountable health communities, I know for a fact that at least um, Enrique is very familiar with this. 2015 to 2016, CMS started moving. It's the mover and shaker for change in the healthcare system. And it basically gave New Mexico, along with other states, a planning grant in which I would say over 100 stakeholders from all the different kinds of fields that were involved came together to design an innovation plan, in other words, to revamp both our public and healthcare systems to change the system in New Mexico. Um, we did a great job of planning with a lot of community input and everything. CMS actually even liked our plan, but at that time, if you'll notice 2016, that was an election year and you know who got elected and CMS kind of decided it was gonna change its whole approach at that time. And so we never got the implementation funding to do this. Instead, CMS then said, we will fund research pilots 2018 to 2021 and had groups apply to become accountable health community models. And several groups in our state also went for this, but literally, again, this was having a healthcare system create a sort of network of community-based organizations that would work with them to provide the social means like food supply, housing help, legal help, uh, domestic violence help, those kinds of things. Enrique knows this because he, uh, the, the Health Equity Center in Bernalillo was part of that CBO network and part of the advisory group when Presbyterian and UNMH got the Bernalillo Accountable Health Community Grant. So we did get one of these CMS grants. Now, the reason this is called research is because they have to screen patients for whether they have any of these needs. You know, do you have enough to eat at home? Do your children have enough to eat three meals a day? These kinds of things. If a patient has a problem, they need to be referred, just as you were talking about before, to a community-based organization um, that would be able to handle that. CHWs were involved as both navigators, screeners, helpers in any sense in this program. And then we tracked patients. So there was a data system, whoops, sorry, data system to gather that kind of, you know, who was referred, who did they go to, what happened and have it coming back? Because literally the research project was to say, will we have lower health costs and will we have improved health outcomes if we combine you know, or integrate the medical services with the social services in this. Santa Fe went for one of those grants, but didn't get it, but they actually funded their accountable health community in a different way. And we'll hear from them in a minute. Now, the only thing I wanna pull up here is for any of you interested out of this work, because a lot of people got much more interested in trying to overcome social drivers of health. The New Mexico Social Drivers of Health Collaborative was formed and we basically saw there were so many groups in New Mexico trying to do really good work, including health councils and all of that. Um, but nobody was really that coordinated and we have competition in our funding. And so things, a lot of times didn't work to have people really get together to make you know, effective services. So we were trying in this group to pull together anyone interested in sharing data, sharing information, working with others in partnership to really move forward. One of the, the other goals, and this is for current times, was that we said this group would have a community voice. We would be seen by the healthcare authority and DOH as the group that would try to provide the community input into the design of this closed loop referral system to make it more effective for everybody. 
quick question. We're going to go to the value-based payment. And again, you may know more about this than I do, but what payment method do we generally face when we go in to see a doctor or a hospital? Is it fee-for-service, value-based? One. How do we pay? What is the payment system in our healthcare system? Let me ask you this. We're fee for service, correct? Right. You are fee for service because every time we go in for a service, whether it's a lab test, whether you, you have an appointment with a doctor, whether you're seeing a specialist, whether you have a certain kind of test, anything, you pay for that particular service. Whether or not you get a solid health come out of it, whether or not you get cured or, you know, get something that really helps you, which Barry didn't get when he saw his. So where we want to move and the whole nation is moving this way is what they're calling value-based care. Now, there are different systems for doing this, but essentially they're going to have more accountability with providers in the sense of measurements now to see how well, what is the quality of the service they're providing. Are they seeing more of the people who really need this and who have been disadvantaged in getting these kinds of things? And are they improving health outcomes? And so the method of payment, essentially, a lot of the healthcare providers need to figure out what does it cost them as a whole to provide certain services, including things like, you know, physical therapy, everything else, or even seeing a community-based provider, let's say for food. What does all of that cost them? And that's what they get paid each time something like this happens, whether or not their costs are actually higher or lower. Um, than that. So we're moving in that direction. And the key players, as, as you all know, it's Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services because they're funding a lot of this. The New Mexico Healthcare Authority, which it will be in July, that's the one that is running the Medicaid and the turquoise care services. So they're having a big hand in this. And it is the healthcare authority that will be designing the state closed loop referral system. A lot of this is also guided by New Mexico's Primary Care Council. And so many of you may remember about 2021, the legislature in New Mexico set up a Primary Care Council, which again is kind of managed by the healthcare authority. And they are basically, they were charged with revolutionizing primary care in our state. In other words, the legislators were fed up with how poor our healthcare system was and said, do something particularly around primary care. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, we now have a 10 and a half year grant from the CMS to implement value-based care, grow our workforce in primary care and improve the system in terms of quality care and everything. So that's a big part of this. The other one is, again, you're much more familiar with the Department of Health and the State Health Improvement Plan. And if you remember, their priorities are around social drivers of health, access to primary care, behavioral health, and, you know, again, partnering. So all of these kind of come together in a way in terms of interests. And July is going to be a key month for a lot of this getting started. Finally, the kind of big common areas for turquoise care and making care primary, this is what you're is to try and create more team-based care. So you were talking about, for instance, dentists should be much more involved in this. Mental health, behavioral health, but with primary care sort of leading on this, but it's meant to be team-based approaches and much more integrated and accessible. Um, the basic thing is to strengthen the value-based payment method of doing this. So these teams are gonna to have to figure out how much does it cost to take care of a particular problem. Um, so, and strengthening the primary care system. The other one is again, advancing health equity in terms of doing these primary care approaches. There are at least five audiences or groups that 
turquoise care says it's going to focus much more on, including, for example, Native Americans, including seniors with long-term health problems, uh, prenatal, and uh, mothers having babies. Um, and you know those are all you know serious issues here. But the other big part of this is within this partnerships, we will have partnerships with community-based organizations who can provide the services that the healthcare system doesn't. And then at the bottom, you will see that, and this is kind of a potential real benefit for community-based organizations, but we don't know yet how it's gonna work, but that's being paid for the services that are provided to these people. Because as you well know, in many cases, they're not paid for. Again, many of you, I don't know if Dan Jennings is on this call, I didn't see, um, but many of you are probably aware that in counties, in local areas, in regional areas in the state, there are groups that are already setting up referral systems and close the referral systems. Some, you know, much more complex maybe than others. Um, but for example, Santa Fe Connect, some of you may be familiar with them, they are doing it. More of you may be familiar with Connect Dona Ana, which I believe is getting off the ground and it is kind of following the model of Santa Fe Connect. Um, there is a whole new one supposedly taking place in the whole northeastern area of New Mexico with Ankrum Health. 100% um, Chavez is what Dan Jennings is running in Chavez. Um, and that is a close of referral system. So many of you or the CDOs or your members may have already been approached by like either uh, Presbyterian, UNM Health, uh, the hospital system, others saying, you know, could you be part of our community-based organization network? Are you, you know, willing to be part of this network for this? So there are small scale CLRS efforts taking place. And then there is the state, which is only just beginning. I'm gonna skip this one for a moment. Essentially, this was the diagram to just kind of give you the idea of the circular approach. And the key for making this all happen, and some of you brought this up, is having an IT platform that basically serves as the connector of all organizations, the facilitator of all the work, the data collection system, the tracking system, and everything else. So that if we look, for example, here, I'm just going to give you the basic pieces of a closed loop referral system. Um, it's going to look very familiar to somebody like, you know, Enrique, in terms of the accountable health care, accountable health model. No, 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 no. Care model. <laughs> because it's kind of based on that. But the key here is a strong IT platform. Um, the state, the healthcare authority has, has recently contracted with the IT platform Find Help. Some of you may know it. I have a funny feeling some of you are working more with other IT platforms like Unite Us and a couple of others. So one of the questions here becomes how do all these IT platforms interconnect, talk to each other, and do things. So the idea is again, somebody comes in, let's say it's to a healthcare system with a medical problem. They are screened. And as of 2023, CMS requires all hospitals, FQHCs and others to screen their, pay, their low income patients at this point for any of these social needs, such as food, housing, transportation, you've got it. Okay, they are screened. Those needs are being coded much like the medical um, diagnoses, and they are to be in, put into the electronic health records. That's still a moving process, but that's what's taking place. All right, once it's in the EHR, then there is a factor or a group in the IT platform that goes through and notices, okay, this person was, you know, signaled out. This person needs to be referred and connected. There is a selection of a community-based organization from a network. Now, I try to explain to people the network, you all know in your own insurance company or whatever, that if you go to a network provider, doctor, 
then you're probably going to pay less. You supposedly get better access, but I'm not sure about that. But definitely the payment is different. Okay, so now what you're talking about is a network of community-based organizations who have contracts with the healthcare system to be able to do this kind of connection for them and the work. So they are then referred. The CBO then, you know, engages that person. They probably do another screening, find out more about what's going on and create a case management piece or something else to service them and help them with their needs or whatever. They may find out, and this is, I think you've all seen this, they may come in because they don't have enough food for their family and all of a sudden you find out there's some, you know, domestic violence happening with them also. So they may need to be referred again to another community-based organization or service. Okay, so once that service is provided and we know what's going on, that data, by the way, these are all data tracking things. So anybody involved in any of these steps is going back and entering that data into the IT platform. And these may be community health workers even doing this. So that information goes back and that information is then made available to anybody in this particular system who was involved in the sort of care and support of that person. Um, this is the very simple basic outline of what goes on. You can probably start guessing at all kinds of, you know, hey, wait a minute, what about this or what about this at various pieces? One big thing has been brought out and other states may be doing this, but as many of you know, a lot of the community-based organizations who are doing this kind of service work, they do a good job on their services, but they often don't have the financial resources or even the staff resources to be able to handle a lot of the management pieces, a lot of the financial areas of this. They may not be very sophisticated in contracting and you know, following up on contracts, what about their training for this IT platform? What about any kind of skill building to handle this extra IT platform and everything? So there's an idea for creating community care hubs like a backbone agency that can do this for the network of community-based organizations. In New Mexico, we don't know. We don't know whether that would be something that we try to think about or whether there's even any kind of organization or grouping that could, you know, do this, have all those skills and capabilities. So this is just, I'm sorry, I should have done this. So a community here hub could do sort of the contracting with the MCOs, helping with payment, doing the billing for a CBO, uh, managing those referrals, you know, doing a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, it's just to keep thinking about as something that might be in the piece. Now, in New Mexico, again, same kind of these, but, you know, we have Synchronous, which is our health information exchange, and also has all the electronic health records from all the different healthcare platforms and everything. They have a lot of IT platforms and coordinate with a lot, so they may be of great use in this, but we don't know yet how that would fit. The other thing is, all of you very well know, if we don't have a good, strong referral database made up of you know the CBOs and it's kept up to date with up to date contacts and addresses and phone numbers and everything else we're dead in the water so we need this resource database and the find help IT platform is even now talking with like share new mexico and 211 to see about integrating them into this piece and then we have our network, and let's not forget that navigators and CHWs and others are needed in this. We just don't know exactly where they might be or to whom they might report or anything else. I'm going to skip these next two slides and just go to the let's talk so that we have some time around this. And if you want, I can go back to the slide that shows the closed loop referral system. But I did want us, if we could, kind of talk about some of these, these questions on what comes up for you as these changes start to take place. 
the legislature has paid for a closed loop referral system. So it will happen. It's just, we don't know what it's going to look like yet or anything else. Um, the primary care changes, the value-based payments, things like that, that's going to take place. And this all is really starting around July of this year. So health councils are key to public health. They are made up of community-based organizations that provide services. I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts about what does this mean for health councils, if anything? Uh, what might health councils get involved in? What part could you play in this whole kind of change? Chris, I think um, one thing that stood out to me was on uh, when you talked about the resource database for the referrals um, and what the health councils can um, play a role in is to provide, as long as that IT platform is there, to provide that information that can go into that database for each community. I think that's very important. I think that's that's what's lacking. Um, we, we do have the information, we just don't have that IT platform um, that can be tapped into. That's a great point. Um, that's a very key point. And I, again, I don't know if Dan Jennings is on this call because he actually did talk to Find Help and I was on that. But you know, a number of you all are also involved with the 100%. And the 100% has had a lot of the health councils already survey their county, find you know, the most up-to-date information about these resources, where you are. And so you know, one of my questions is, okay, you've got these resources, just like you were saying, how are you gonna connect with Find Help to make sure that's what they get? And you know, how does 100% come into this? <laughs> that that's a great point on the resource piece. I did have a question on um so when we talk about these referrals would the referrals then be initiated through a health provider? Is that where the referral would initiate from? You know, for, for the state, close the referral system. And for anything that the CMS has been funding, they've approached it from the healthcare side because that's what they generally, you know, are focused on. There is no reason, however, and for example, Dan Jennings' effort in Chavez, I don't believe he started with the healthcare system. Um, so his was more like what many of you do in the community. It could be anybody walking into a school-based health center, or it could be somebody walking into you know, a food bank in your area. And so while, let's say, somebody in the food bank is helping them, they find out, oh my God, you know, there's something else they need help with, and then they make a referral. So in my own mind, in a general closed of referral system, I believe that first kind of referral or screening, if you will, could be in the healthcare system side, or it could be from the community. But somehow they would be connecting. Let's say if that person had gone into the food bank, and what they discovered was this person seemed to have symptoms of, you know, early pre-diabetes or something, and so they wanted to refer them to the healthcare side. They could do that. It's, it's, you know, supposed to be circular on that. But I think the states is going to be kind of an emphasis with CMS funding on coming from the healthcare side out to the community. Was that clear or? Yes, uh huh. But I think there's still going to be that disconnect from where if an organization, local organization, needs to refer, there's still going to be that gap. If it, um, if they're not actually going to see a healthcare provider, but they still need services um and i think that's where like the different um organizations were looking at that what connect new mexico and then all these other platforms um the communities were looking into that as well you know to to have the local um uh, platform 
where they can make the referrals locally. And, you know, Dan, I think Dan Jennings would be a good resource for any of you that want to, you know, follow that any further. But, you know, along those lines, and just as you said, there are a number of different IT platforms and software that, uh, you know, a lot of groups are using. Uh, some of the groups, uh, let's say home visiting, for example, that you might want to refer people for that kind of support. They generally have contracts with, you know, the early childhood department. That's a whole different IT platform. It's a whole different data gathering and data entry system and everything else. So one of the things that Find Help is doing right now is trying to talk to the other IT platforms or groups that have them. And part of that is to see, are they going, you'll get used to this word coming up, interoperable. <laughs> you know, can they share data? Can they, is it going to be smooth? That you're, you've got a great point. And any other questions you might have about the system that you feel are, you know, that you want to have passed up to the healthcare authority or something, feel free on that. Would any of you consider, you know, doing a little bit more, let's say, as things develop a little bit more, doing like another presentation with your members themselves? around what's going on and getting input from them about, because they're the community-based organizations that are going to be contacted either by healthcare systems or other groups or by Find Health about becoming part of the network, which means they're contracting to do the services they usually do for patients or other people referred to them. They may have questions about this or how is it going to work for them? Would you be interested in having discussions with them and gathering their ideas or concerns? I, I would say yes, maybe some, yeah, looking in the future, in the near future. When we have more information, yeah. Yes. And I think the health council's meetings are a good platform to do that because that's mostly geared towards, uh, you know, health providers and things like that. So as you know, more information is coming out. We want to roll this out to the community and get you know buy-in from the local um, health providers. Uh, I think the health council is because I mean they're already established. They're they're trusted in the community. I think that would be a good platform for them to to roll out the information within the community. And part of why I suggest this is I'm as most of you know I've worked with the health councils before, being with DOH and such, but. I know that you all have the added funding that the legislature gave you for this year, but part of that is going to be in terms of getting that money kind of refunded on a continuing basis is what do the health councils have to show for this? And I'm just trying to also figure out ways. This is a big health system kind of change that is going to start taking place. It may not happen that much this year. I just don't know. But I'm just thinking if there are ways for the health councils to be involved in having a say or helping their communities have a say in a health system design or change, to me, that would seem like a very great role for the health councils to have. So I'm just kind of putting out some ideas out there too for you to think about. Any other thoughts you might have about <laughs> how health councils might play a role or um, any kinds of questions you had while looking? Do you want me to back up to the design of the closed loop referral system or is this fine? I, 
I, I can tell you right now, having just sat in a, on a whole big training of Roadrunner <laughs> with a, a lot of the different food banks that it contracts with and has in a network down in Southern New Mexico, biggest question for them is, are we gonna get paid for the extra services we provide and how are we gonna get paid? <laughs> and I'm assuming most CBOs are gonna be thinking about that. Chris, um, this is Barry again. And yeah. this is a little this is a little bit off base, but it's the perfect segue for a comment that I would like to make. And this is my personal opinion, so I could be 200% off base, but I think part of receiving proper medical attention in New Mexico has a little bit to do with some discrimination on some level. Yes. Um, New, Me New Mexico, when I called to make my appointment at the dentist, I asked why it was taking so, taking so long and the receptionists told me that uh, private dentists in the state have stopped accepting Medicare and Medicaid payments because they don't like waiting two or three years to get paid. So those of us who don't have private insurance have to go to these health clinic dentists and they are so backed up that, that that's the problem. And mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a really good friend in Albuquerque and he has a son that plays football for Valley High School. And last year he received a catastrophic injury and he went to the Presbyterian Emergency Center with his shoulder blade actually protruding through his skin. And he um, went, went into the emergency room and the father didn't have private insurance. And that boy sat in that emergency room 39 hours before he saw a doctor with his shoulder blade sticking out through his skin. You know, very, it, see, you've raised a point, and I've tried to be very positive, as most people are, I think, about this kind of change. Um, and you'll note that I had said part of it is to promote equity um, and things like that. But I believe that the devil is in the details mm -hmm. with this. And it's fine to say this at a very high level, um, but one still has to go back in. And the only thing with this is to think about the fact that there's going to be data now and it's tracking data. And part of that would be, I mean, there may very well be things like, you know, do you have a disability, you know, or, you know, your race or things like that. I'm still not sure. There are big questions about the data that's collected, you know, ah. and who has access to that data and everything else. But you're now seeing an effort to collect the kind of data and with the accountability measures that they're going to start putting on physicians. One of those, the one of the first ones they're going to do starting in July is how long does a person have to wait to get an appointment with a primate? They're going to start measuring that. So there are, in my mind, opportunities for this system to get better or to help with those kinds of problems. But again, I'm, I'm now expressing just my own personal opinion. If the community is not involved, if, for example, community-based organizations don't get a say in what their concerns are, the physicians are getting their say because they are included in the primary care council or have representatives Mm -hmm. And they are working with a lot of those people. So, you know, my feeling is it has to involve all the stakeholders in saying, yeah. here's the issue, here's the question, how is that going to be handled? That kind of thing. And Rebecca, I know that we are a little over time, uh, but very, I hear your point, and that's why I'm concerned. And the other thing, just for all of you, if you feel it, I know that Sarah's a part. Dan Jennings is, Maureen comes. Any of you are welcome to join um, the New Mexico Social Drivers of Health Collaborative, in particular, if you want to come to the Community Engagement Work Group, which I and Jessica Osengrove run. We're trying to be sure that we do get people's input to this. 
Um, it may take a while, but that's another thing for your health councils if you want to consider, you know, connecting, you know, okay. with other person. And I, the, the Alliance does. The Alliance is a member. So you are getting information that way. And Val does speak for your health councils also. Thank you. Rebecca, I will turn it back to you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. And thanks for all the information. It was great to talk about the closed loop referral systems. If you want to send over that link to join um, the SDOH Collaborative, we can send it out via email um, with your slides as well, if you want. Is, it, is there still a link or just email? You know, my last slide, which I didn't show, I, I put the website. We actually have a website now. Oh, the wow. website and the others where that can be done. So I will okay, send the whole perfect. thing. <laughs> Great. Then we'll just refer to the last slide then for all of that information. And we'll send that out to everybody. And we'll send it out to all health councils, not just the people here. And most of you know me. So if you ever have any comments or you want to bring something to my attention that you feel is like a burning issue for this kind of topic, please, you know, just contact me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Me you too. too. This is great, a great meeting. And very well presented and very well done. Thank you. And every, everybody have a good weekend. Thanks, everyone. I agree. Great job, Chris, as always. You're always so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. If you have a free moment after this, feel free to give me a call. I miss you. Okay. All right. Bye. Rebecca, Bye, could I possibly get a copy of your, if you record this, which mm -hmm. I noticed, even if it's just the last kind of part of the session, I just want to be sure I got what people were telling me so that I can pass. Yeah. And we publish these onto YouTube so we can, you'll just, I can send you the link directly to the whole recording. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Have a good one, Take everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Chris. Thanks.